We're going to talk about God's sacrifice. No. Oh. All right, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Obviously, the breath of life is the spirit. The soul, we have no idea where it came from except from God. Uh, somebody said one time, what, do you have a storehouse full of soul? No, that's uh, it's, that's up to God. I, it doesn't matter to me, but the living soul means that once the spirit of life was in it, God had already pre uh, formed the body out of the dust, and the body just laid there until the living of God came into him, which is the spirit of man, and so he became a living soul. And then verse eight, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed out of the ground, made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant in sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay. Now, he, in planting thee, he said, uh, look in verse 15. And the Lord God took the man, put him into the garden of Eden to dress and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof shall be thou shalt surely die. Okay, I want to go over to boy. Really get bad here. All right, Genesis chapter five. Now, we know between Genesis uh, 2 and Genesis 5 what Adam and Eve did. And God said in the day thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. He didn't say uh, in the day thou eatest, that day thou shalt die. That's not what the verse says. Matter of fact, go back and read it with me. He says in verse uh, 17, Genesis 2, 17, but the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou uh, shall not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So the day eats the of the tree will cause death. How do I know? Well, let's go over to Genesis chapter 5 and look with me in uh, uh, verse 5, Genesis 5, 5, which Five is the number of grace, and five is the number of death in the Bible. So in Genesis 5, 5, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. The end of the verse is telling you what God said would happen to him when he ate. The years, that is, he was allowed to live even though he's going to die. So his destiny is death because of the disobedience. But look with me in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 3. And I want to get some verses here. One verse at least. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was taken, for dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. Okay? And we know that, uh, look with me in verse, chapter 3, verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. All right, and when the Lord comes in, they're, they're hiding. And the hiding represents the fact of the knowledge. Uh, they were not knowledgeable 
of nakedness before they ate of that. And I'll uh, now go back to Genesis 3, verse 20. And Adam called his wife name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Well, to have the skins, he had to obviously kill an animal. And I personally believe that's the sacrifice he made for them and uh, for them to live on in life, even though they were now going to be the, the parents of the, of the children and the children being sin. Look in Romans 5. And I know that's simple and all that, but I want you to go to Romans 5 because I got a reasoning for all this. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered the world, into the world is uh, children, okay? Into the world by the disobedience. What, whatever comes out of Adam and Eve, and we know that God made Adam, and then he made Eve to be his helpmate to have children, woman being man with womb, uh, because he took the rib out of Adam and, and, and made form fashioned a a woman, a, uh, a helpmate, a mate for Adam. But in the disobedience, whatever comes forth out of man and woman, which that's the natural way, contrary to what America's trying to follow, the, the right way is a man and woman, they're going to have children. And that children, when they enter into the world, they're going to be sin also, and they're going to die. All right, for Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all of sin. So that's the disobedience of verse 19, Romans 5, 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And Ephesians says that we were children of disobedience. It doesn't matter what you do in life, you're still a child of disobedience by birth. Okay? So... We need something to get us out of this birth uh, that destiny of birth. We see people are trying to clean up something that can't be cleaned up. The only way that this gets cleaned up is, is to die. The way you sin is death. So God in his righteousness is going to make a sacrifice that will satisfy the legalistic part of the Bible. But now let's go on. Genesis 22. In Genesis 22, we'll go through that stuff with uh, that we're talking about later in Paul's writings. But I want to go to Genesis 22. And Abraham's a very important man in Paul's writings, in his first writings, because uh, Romans 4 is about Abraham, and he talks about Abraham quite a bit. But in Genesis 22, look with me in verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Somebody said, God can't tempt man, not with evil. He doesn't tempt man with evil. Evil comes from another tempter, all right? And said to him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here am I. And I want you to understand that tempting Abraham is going to come from a burnt offering sacrifice. Now, I want you to understand that because it's important that we see the difference between a sin and trespass offer and a burnt sacrifice in the scriptures. And we can learn something about Jesus, his life, and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Okay. In Genesis 22, 1, and it came to pass that after these things, God did tempt Abram, uh, Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, behold, I'm here I am. He said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. And Abraham has Ishmael. But when he says thine only son, that's in the, the promises and the covenants and all that. Ishmael is out of Hagar. Isaac is out of Sarah. And that's the promised seed. And the genealogy will always go through Abraham all the way down to uh, Joseph and Mary. Okay. He says, uh, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, 
and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering. Now, it's very important that you understand a burnt offering is a voluntary offering. It is not the same as sins and trans, uh, transgressions or um, the things that people talk about because the sins and the trespasses are a compulsory. It's compulsive. They, they do that. But a burnt offering is an offering that you make willingly, and it, it's like um, a uh, homage or self-dedication or a thanksgiving. Now, you understand, Abraham and Sarah didn't have a son, and so she talked him into going to Hagar, his her handmaid, and she had a son, Ishmael, and Abraham loved him, and uh, he thought that was his son that the promise was made, but it was. And God told him to go into Sarah, yeah, uh, Sarah, and conceive and have a son, and his name would be Isaac. Isaac is the father of Jacob, and Jacob is the 12 tribes because his name is changed to Israel. So to get the context, offer up the son that you love. This is God telling you, I want you to offer up Isaac, the son that you love, as a burnt offering, as a thanksgiving offering, as a, an, a, uh, a dedication to me and so forth, an homage, pay an homage to me. I gave you the son, I could take the son away in a, in a burnt offering to me. He's saying that. You understand? God is not a bully and God is not mean. This is a trial. This is a trial that at that moment, Abraham doesn't know this. But let's read on. Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went un unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham, and isn't that curious, third day, Abraham lift up his eyes and saw the place far off. And Abraham said unto his young men, abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. So this is a worship that Abraham believes is being done, okay? Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon his Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them, together. And as Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, he said, Father, he said, Here am I, son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, here it is. Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb or a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Now, that's faith. You know that he doesn't want to do what he has to do to Isaac. No way. But he's willing to do what God tells him. Turn to Romans 4. In Romans chapter 4, verse 1, what should we say then that Abraham our father has uh, that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh is found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he have word of glory, but not before God. The book of James says, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith with works. In accordance with the relationship with Abraham, Abraham believed God to have Isaac. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. The offering up of Isaac, the trial of God with him, was a burnt offering of thanksgiving, homage, uh, self-dedication, so forth. In other words, God, you gave this to me. I'm willing to give it back if that's what you want. Now, I want you to think about that in concept with Romans 12. Turn to Romans 12. In Romans 12, verse 1, 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Okay? Present that because of what God did for you. Okay? I mean, we're uh, to be kind one to another, tender heart, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Here we have the chance to offer up our body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God was your reasonable service. Because as Abraham had believed God and he was imputed to him for righteousness, we had a chance to believe and hear the gospel of our salvation. And when we did, God sealed us for eternity. And what we can do is present our body a living sacrifice, which would be our acknowledgement of what he did for us. But that we'll look at some things in a minute. All right, now I want you to think about the, the offering of sin for sins and trans, trespasses takes blood, okay? And that's a compulsory thing that has to be did. Uh, well, the best thing I know to do is a uh, Genesis 8. Look in Genesis 8. And if I fail you, it's my fault. In Genesis 8, there's a lot of sacrifice, a lot of things done in the Old Testament, and each one had a meaning. All right, in Genesis 8, and in all of them done by Israel, you obviously know that. All right, in Genesis 8, look at verse 20. Now, there's been a flood. This flood has come over and destroyed the whole world, except Noah and the people that are with him in the ark. When they come off, in verse 20, Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl offering, offered burnt offerings on the altar, okay? Now, that burnt offering was a thanksgiving. That was a thanksgiving. He, uh, I can see nowhere where God told him to do this. Uh, he, I mean, I, I don't see where God, so the burnt offering is a giving of thanksgiving homage to God that here we are, we're still alive. We went through this horrible thing called the flood where people were, by the hundreds of thousands of millions were destroyed. And yet well, here we are, God, we're alive. You saved us. You let us live. And so this burnt offerings, uh, these burnt offerings are for a homage and a thanksgiving to the Lord. So Instead of Noah burning himself, obviously, as a burnt offering, he offers up animals, okay, as a, a sacrifice of a burnt offering. God, uh, look in Hebrews 13. That'd be a good one. And I, I, you can't make anything perfect, but we can read it. In Hebrews 13, Look with me at verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Uh, in Ephesians, hold down this just a minute. Look with me in Ephesians. All right, in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory. And remember, glory came in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, unto our glory. Glorification came when we trusted the Lord, Romans 8, 29 and 30, that we should be the praise of his glory, first church in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also I do believe you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not of your own. 
for you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He owns them. So your offering that you can present instead of God making you burn it, you can present a living sacrifice. You can present your body. I'll go back to Romans 12 again one more time. In Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Turn to first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them or lost. But it's not hid to you. If you're listening to this and you're saved, it is not hid to you. And if it's not hid to you and you know it, then you are the light in the world. And being the light, you're to give praise to God, give him the glory, because uh, otherwise the gospel is hid. The God of this world hides the gospel to all the world. Religion, number one. The rest of the world doesn't see it through religion because they see religion, but they don't see the glory of God. So what he has is, members of the body of Christ are walking around on the earth and they can present themselves, their body, a living sacrifice. They can, and that would be to homage and thanksgiving and to honor and glory to God. Get, let it do that. We can walk in his good works, Ephesians 2.10. Now watch verse uh, 7, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who came into light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be a God and not us. Now, verse 8 and 9 and 10 are always going to be what happens to that living body if it's presented to God and does the work of God, walking in his good work, giving him praise and glory, praising our Savior for what he did in the sacrifice that he himself gave. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But now, go back with him to Hebrews 13. In the presentation of your body, here also is what Hebrews 13 says in verse 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. And that communication is what Paul talks about all the time. That communication comes from giving now, the world has made you hate giving because they gouge and they prod you and they want to turn you from the true fruit that is part of the body of Christ. They make you to where you don't want to do anything like that because they have hounded you and whatever. But that is not what God said. God said in verse 16, but to do to good and to communicate. And communication is what Paul talks about in his letters, especially the Corinthians and everything, their communication. But look in 2 Corinthians 9, and I'm not, there's not, I'm not preaching on this. I'm not having, I want you to understand that presenting your body a living sacrifice is a sacrifice. You sacrifice with it. Okay. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. If you trust that verse, you better read 5, 6, and 7, 9, 10, and 11, okay? Because it is about communication. It's about the ministering to the saints. It's about ministering to those that need it, on and on. And if uh, 1 Corinthians 9, go with 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look with me here. He says in uh, verse 14, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. I trust God. I have lived by that verse. I trust God to use the people that have presented their body a living sacrifice to help me do the ministry. Sounds, and I'll say it again, Brother Jerry. I trust God. I trust that verse. When I first saw that verse almost 40 years ago, my mentor had taught me it works for Brother Moore didn't work. He never did work. Once he quit work, that was it. He quit and he he began full-time preaching. He never did look back. And I watched him and he taught me 
that God is able. He's able to help you. He's able to help me. As we present our bodies a living sacrifice, if God moves you, and he probably does, and sometimes you may not get moved by him, you give because of the ministry. Well, the ministry that needs you is those that ordained that they preach the gospel to live with the gospel. Religion doesn't need it. They have thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars come in from people that do not know the gospel, do not know the Lord the way they should know him. They are religious. They go on works. They do the things they do. And they offer up and their sacrifice is not accepted of God. The community, the Gentiles, he said, lest the Gentile sacrifices, so it, so it should be sacrificed, is acceptable of the Lord. And the acceptation only comes from members of the body of Christ doing the will of the Lord. Lost people are just giving to religion. They're just giving to the God of this world, and they're worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. That's why religions are rich. Because our gospel is hid, the people that it's hid to are busy working their way to God with their tithes and offerings, and it don't work. A man that gives in the uh, sense of being a true believer, saved and sealed, and the reason he knows he's saved and sealed is somebody preached it to him. And that one that preached him to it may be living of the gospel. Thus, what Hebrews said, but to do good and communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. And that's the way it is. Uh, according to the Corinthian letter, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live with the gospel. I'm not going to take that away from God. I do it. That's the way I live. And it works. Believe me, it works. But it's a based on the sacrifice of Romans 12. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, was your reasonable service. You're bought with a price. Glorify God in that bought possession. Give him the praise. Walk in his good works on and on. All right. Now, but I just wanted you to read that. I mean, that's a great verse. All right. Now, let's look at Jesus starting with Galatians chapter one. And there's, there's many things in the book of Hebrews that you could read about uh, uh, what God didn't accept. Uh, he, now, when I say didn't accept, it would not do the final thing that needs to be done. The offering of blood and bulls and goats that was was what was told under the law. But it didn't take away sin. It just covered it. We need to find out the trueness of how the sin and trespasses and how that the burnt offering was accepted. Let's say it that way. Galatians chapter one. Number one, there has to be a true sacrifice. All the rest of the sacrifices are just covering. Uh, matter of fact, I want you to look with me in, in Romans and in uh, Galatians. Let's check this out. In Galatians chapter three, uh, Romans chapter three, Romans 3, 25, uh, 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, the redemption, Jesus was redeemed from hell. He got back into his body, he ascended to the Father, he presented us holy and without blame before him in love. So we were justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That goes to Romans 4.25, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Okay. If he doesn't rise, you're not justified. If he doesn't rise, you don't have redemption. If you don't have redemption, you don't have forgiveness, on and on and on. Now, verse 25, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation. Propitiation is what sin and trespassing offerings are about. Propitiation, in other words, to put off 
what would have happened if you didn't make those. Let's say it that way. Okay, now watch. A propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And a lot of smart people will take that and they'll say, see, your sins past have propitiation, appeasement, uh, uh, taking off. But now you got to take care of your future sins by confession and living it and so forth. Now, that's not, they forgot to read verse 26. He said, to, to declare, I say, I say, Paul, consider what I say, Paul, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and justify him which believeth in Jesus. So sin and trespass offerings were made without them knowing about Jesus. I, I, I want you to understand that before we go on. It was before Jesus was ever in the world. Sin and trespassing offerings were made without the acknowledgement of Jesus Christ, okay? And it was a propitiational sin. For sins, they would be covered and God wouldn't see it. It's like when the priest would go in the Holy of Holies and he would take the blood of the innocent animal that was slain and he would sprinkle the blood on the ark of the covenant. The ark is a casket. It represents death. It has death in it called the law. The law would kill if it wasn't observed. But what would keep the law from killing them? The blood sprinkled on the casket. God would see the blood, not the law. And so he wouldn't condemn them another year. On and on and on. The same principality. The people under the law would offer sacrifices, which would never take away sin. They would only cover it because it was animal blood. And it wasn't a true sacrifice of God that was coming, but they didn't know all this. And so in a sense, a time comes and a prophecy is made of Isaiah 7, 14, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, that prophecy is there. And in a specific time and date, when the fullness of the time was come, uh, Galatians chapter uh, four, verse four, when the fullness of the time was come, the prophecy of time, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. Okay, made of a woman. He is like humans. Uh, matter of fact, go back to Hebrews chapter two. And, and the Lord said in Hebrews, a body that has made me. Hebrews two, verse 14. For as much then as the children, the children of God, that Satan corrupted by Adam disobedience. And they were called the children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And I, I've said it a hundred times, I'm going to say it again. Not disobedient children. People hadn't sinned after the similitude of Adam necessarily. Romans talks about that. But they're still of the disobedient one so they're still children of disobedience and what god is doing is taking care of the children of disobedience he's taking care of the world if the world will let him he's made reconciliation he's made forgiveness he's made redemption he's made atonement the whole nine yards in grace his grace has made it available so you you read this he said in verse 14, for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Death is controlled by the murderer. John 8, 44, Satan is the murderer. He murdered the children of God. He caused disobedience to be in the blood of all of them. And so and so, but God, in His mercy, made a propitiation for sins that were past, for as long as He's dealing with the Jews. But for us of grace, He's made redemption. He's made forgiveness of sins and trespasses and on and on. But we'll get into some more of that. But you understand, look in uh, uh, Galatians chapter 1. And remember, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him, not anything was made as made. 
We know that Hebrews 1 says that Jesus was appointed heir of all things, and by him was the word a world made because he's the word. And God said the word, said, and did, okay? So God sent forth his son. He sent the word in the flesh. And I want you to really concentrate on this. He sent the word in his flesh. This is amazing. The word does what the written word says. He told Moses, write it in the books. It was written, the prophecies, all the things were written. David wrote the Psalms and uh, Solomon and Ecclesiastes or whatever, or whatever Solomon wrote. Right now, my mind's going 100 miles an hour. He wrote all this stuff down. And then when he came in the world, he fulfilled everything that is said about him with nothing forgotten because he wrote it himself anyway. So, well, men wrote it down with the inspiration of Christ in them. That's exactly what Peter says. And so everything he wrote down, he fulfills. That means that your Bible is total righteousness. It is totally right. It's totally true. The King James is telling you about the faith of Christ that he had to live in accordance to what he prophesied about himself. And it wasn't good, folks. There are so many verses that you read how that it had to be horrible for Jesus in the flesh to face what he had to face. I believe in that garden when them tears and that, that sweat was like drops of blood. He was, I mean, totally, totally fearing what had to be but his faith of his father and the truth of the word would never fail and god's son knew he'd be raised from the dead but that doesn't make the three days without fear you uh, that are saved that are listening you don't have to fear death you don't have to fear hell. You can't go to hell. Jesus took them both. His life was uncomfortable. No one liked him. Yet he healed the sick and raised the dead, loved children. Incredible human being. A human that as touching the infirmity of the flesh and and when I say he didn't have sin, but he had the flesh, which had the total ability to disobey, but he didn't. He kept it. He loved the Lord thy God. He kept the law perfect, tempted in all points that knew no sin. But the trial of it had to be horrible. All around him, disillusioned people hating him and claiming to be religious, loving his father, which they didn't love. You're not of my father. You're of your father, the devil. And so he, as he's looking at all of it, experiencing it, it had to be horrible. Yet his joy was returning, going to the father. That's where our joy should be. Our joy should be in the fact that God has invited us into his household. We're going to be allowed to come to God by his works. His son. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, 3. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus, from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Jesus gave himself voluntarily. He gave his entire life to God to do whatever God wanted. He turned his will over to God's will. Okay, so he gave himself. Now look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians 5, these are familiar verses, but with what we're talking about, maybe put it in perspective. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
Verse 21, for he, that would be God, had made him the Lord, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. All our life when we're born, we know we're going to die. Unless we were shown, 1 Thessalonians 4, the destiny is death. That's why men have fought for the fountain of youth. They've tried to get things that make them healthy to live long time and prosper and all that. Uh, it's something that is assurance in your life. You're going to die. You're going to come to a point that your body's going to get old and, and die. We we look at pictures of our youth, and then we look at us now and how we're changing. Our heads have changed. Our facial appearances, our bodies have changed. And then you look at people that you've known when they're youth, and then when you see them again at this age, you go, wow, they don't look like they used to. No, we change. We we develop and whatever, but then this body, because of what we eat and what we drink and what we do, and the lust of the flesh that we do, our body changes and it gets worse and it gets old and then it dies. Why does it die? Because we are children of disobedience in the body. We're a body of sin and death. That's, that's what we are. Romans is very clear on that. But We've been given a chance for a spirit to come in us, which is called the spirit of the dear son, Romans 8, 9. And if that spirit comes in us by our allowing it, by trust, we hear the gospel of our salvation. Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, and was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to scripture. If we can trust that, to be our salvation, then we groan within ourselves to be released from knowing that this will never do anything but get older and come to a point of death. But God has also made a way for us that if the time came that God is ready for the body of Christ to leave the world so that Hebrews through Revelation doctrine begins to work, he can change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And what God will make into our old body, that is up to God, but he will change it. And of course, Paul comes up with the Corinthian letter and says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The sleep have been changed. They left this body who's caused nothing but sin, has caused nothing to warrant it to go to God the way it is. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so they left their body, the soul and the spirit went to God and sleeps in a new body. Second Corinthians chapter five, one through five. Great, they've been changed. But he said, we shall not all be changed. Uh, I apologize. We shall not all be all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So here we are down here alive. And what if it's the day that God said it's time to come up? We're still in this body. We haven't been changed. And this body ain't going to God. So what will he do? Well, Philippians chapter three. You see, I couldn't say these things unless God wrote it. I can't claim things that God didn't write, especially if he didn't write it to me or if he didn't write it at all. Do you realize what the world would be in if Romans through Philemon wasn't in the body? What would be going on? Time won't work. Things won't work. Nobody would be living up to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we're, we're, what did we get? We got letters showing us what God would do for us. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Maybe I'm 73 the other day. Maybe I ain't going to go out in death of dying with this body going to the dirt. Maybe God's going to say one day while I'm still alive, come up, meet me in the air. My saints are with me. Why, folks, 
that's what Paul's letters tell us. I'm not making these things up. That's what Paul's letters tells us. All these things are possible in Paul's writings. The Lord says, come up. I've got the saints are awake and with me and we're in the clouds waiting for you. Lord, how do I come up? You said that flesh and blood cannot, boom, it don't matter. Philippians 3, 20, for our conversations in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it, that vile body, may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he's even able to subdue all things unto himself. Turn to 1 Thessalonians and watch. Paul Believe that verse. How do I know? Philippians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Boom, you got it. It's written down. You can claim it. You can live by it. You can joy by it. You can joy. You can rejoice if you presented your body a living sacrifice. And even though things are going wrong or things aren't going the way you want it to go wrong, do good, communicate, give, give whatever you need to give, do whatever you need to do. Why? That's good. It's in God's will. Wait a minute. You could actually go out alive. I'm a coward. I like to go out alive. I'd hate, I, I hate the thought of what's probably coming for me if the Lord tarries. As I get older, my sister has problems and uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Maybe I'm going to get it. I don't know. Maybe I would go in a nursing home. Maybe I would just die. I don't know what's going to happen to me. No one knows. But as long as I'm alive, I can present my body a living sacrifice. And I can do the will of God, which is preach and teach the pastors and teachers. I can keep the faith if I want to. And I can glory in the name of the Lord, giving him praise and glory, giving him the gratitude and the, the thanksgiving, the homage to him because of what he did. Now, you understand what I'm saying? I want you to look with me in Ephesians chapter five and six. The animal, the lamb that was offered up yearly, Passover, and then the other things that were offered up were animals and, and they had no choice in it. Man overcome them, man killed them, and then offered up whatever, the meat and the blood. But Jesus Christ is a man, and he can do right or wrong. Say, well, Brother Jesus shouldn't say something. No, he's a man, just like Adam was a man. And he can either obey or disobey. Uh, I, before I read Ephesians 5, go to Romans chapter 5. Look with me in verse uh, 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one. Did Jesus fulfill all righteousness? Yes, he did. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, many should be made righteous. Was he obedient? Yes. So in his obedience... He's not like the animal and the animal's blood. He has human blood. And this human blood is not tainted. It is pure. It is of the Father. And Jesus in the body obeys God. He does not defile the temple. Keep that in mind. You remember that verse in Corinthians said, any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. That ain't safe people, folks. A person that will not let the spirit of Christ in him 
is disobedience. He has not obeyed the faith. He has not accepted what God is offering, and him will God destroy. There is this world. He's not going to destroy you. Somebody said, well, if you sin, if you defile the temple, I already preached a long time ago, if you smoke, you're defiling the temple. Where in God's name in the Bible is that? Or if you drink too much, you defile the temple. Where in God's name is that? It's not there, folks. Dancing, playing cards, doing all the things that people do as in daily sinful fleshly things. That's not going to get you to uh, uh, your temple destroyed. What will destroy your temple is not receiving the love of the truth that you might be saved. Not accepting the work of God. Not accepting the sacrifice of God. Now watch Ephesians 5.1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for an off us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And by the way, the sin and trespass offerings are a propitiation. And when you think about a sweet-smelling uh, savor, this, uh, I believe that's in Genesis 22. And Genesis, well, it's in, in Genesis. The, the burnt offering was a sweet-smelling savor. Mm. You know, hmm. Jesus Christ is an offering for sin and trespasses. God made that offering for sin and trespasses. Where he went is hell fire. Huh. Like I said, you can't make everything just fit perfectly but it sure looks close. The burnt offering was Jesus' way to satisfy God. Hmm. That is amazing. Isn't it? The man's down in the garden and he's sweating horribly. Father, if it be that, thou will let this cup pass from me. The cup, the cup of what? Everybody is going to die, die fleshly wise. That's not the judgment. That's the inheritance. Our inheritance, if Christ is in us, is heir of God and joint heir with Christ. But man's inheritance is death. So dying's not the judgment. That's the inheritance. What's the judgment? The judgment is, where does your soul go? Well, our souls will go to God. We've been invited up there to a new body, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. But where does the soul of a man that doesn't have that waiting for him it goes down into death because Jesus went to hell, took that judgment for us, then went through death and out to give us holy and without blame judgment. I, 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 people get mad at me for preaching on hell and saying that Jesus went to hell. They get mad at me over this and over that. Folks, be glad. Be, get, give God the glory that that sacrifice that Jesus did was a sweet-smelling savor. Totally sweet-smelling savor. That is incredible. When you think about the... Uh, go, go to Genesis 8. Let's see if I can find what I'm on. In Genesis 8... Verse uh, 20. All right. The flood. Noah got off. This is what he did. Verse 20. 
And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took a very clean beast and every clean fowl and offered a burnt offering on the, on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And remember, Paul brought that up in Ephesians, a sweet smelling savor. When the burnt offering given by the Lord I don't know how to say this. Jesus gave himself that he could become the sacrifice for trespasses and, and sins. He gave himself a burnt offering before the foundation of the world. Don't you think he didn't see he was going to hell and prophesied it in Psalm 16, that I will not leave my soul in hell and made to see in Acts chapter two, quoted, and so Jesus offers up a burnt offering to give homage and thanksgivingness, thanksgivingness. I say, how could you say that if he's in hell for you and I? He thanked the Lord. Are you listening? He thanked the Lord for forgiving you for his sake. You know, on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Talking about Israel. They didn't know what they were doing. The God's world didn't know what they were doing. According to 1 Corinthians 2, 5 through 8, it was a mystery. Because if the devil would have known what God was truly doing for us, he would have never crucified the Lord's glory. But he did. And was grateful. Man, he loved it. I, I bet he went up before God up there in the, in the space and said, look, God. They denied your son and killed him. I got you again. I got you in the garden and I got you again. And I'm sure the Lord just looked at him and said, we'll see. And the day that Jesus Christ appeared to Paul, man, what he showed that man. He showed that man so many mysteries. And so many glorious things. And so the world denies Romans through Philemon. Teaches Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Hebrews through Revelation. Old Testament. And denies the words written for us in this age. Age of grace. And he showed Paul the things that were in heaven and the things in earth. And he showed him an inheritance that we can have by trusting the gospel of our salvation. What God did, he offered up a sacrifice and that sacrifice was a man. His blood was pure. The man died and the blood was forgiveness. In shedding of that blood, he's going to die. And the judgment, Jesus offered himself up to burn in hell for three days as a gratefulness to God for us. And then all that God left, besides us hearing it and believing it, we could present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is a reasonable service. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 7. Purge out therefore that old the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The time of the Passover, the people were told to cut the animal's throat, get the blood, put it on hyssop, put it on the doorpost. What would that do? They keep that death angel from getting their firstborn. That blood kept that house safe. Are you listening? The blood of the Lord keeps your house safe unless it comes time for it to die. Say, so what do you mean safe? Man, you go through the Psalms and the Proverbs and look at what he says about the righteous and the just. You've been made righteous. 
you're just before him, justified. And he takes care of you. Say, well, why do we have all the misery and stuff we have in the world? Because the body is a body of sin. But the soul and the spirit are in that body. And it's wanting to produce for God his will. Jesus in his body didn't have the nature of sin to fight him like that. He had the temptations. But inside of that body is the soul and spirit of Jesus Christ. That body was made for him by God. And so he presents that body to the will of God. As he works, he presents that will, that body to the will of God. And in doing so, he suffers. He fights against the things that are wrong. Uh, he's, people hate him. He, he said, the Bible says he weeped of their unbelief. He was tired. He had to rest. He got hungry. Part of living. Everything's part of living, folks. If you have things wrong, it's just part of living. And we had to get through them. As we get through them, God is able to make all grace abound to us. That way, having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. God is able to take care of us, even though we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter in Romans chapter 8. The devil hates us. The world hates us. But God loves us. And God wants us to walk in his good works and give him the glory and to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Look in, uh, I think this is the one I uh, shut up uh, once some, this is the one I want in, uh, uh, Sacrifice uh, Psalm 51. In Psalm 51 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrary heart, contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. You know, I, I can just see Paul, you know, everything I've done, I count it but dumb. All the things I was counting on to be my legacy of no value. My realization is, Paul said, I was alive without the law once, but when the law revived, I died. Oh, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? You, you read things in Paul's writing, yet he gloried in the persecutions and the afflictions. He gloried in the things that he suffered for Christ's sake. And he was a debtor, both the Greeks and barbarians. God saved him for a reason, and so are we. We are saved for a reason. We're saved for a course. We're saved for duty, and we can walk in it. We can present our body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, with your reasonable service. If you're not a preacher, that doesn't matter. You, God didn't take any glory away from you. If you're not a pastor or teacher, God didn't take any glory from you. Say, well, I'm just in the body of Christ. No, you're a member, and particular, 1 Corinthians 12. And in that membership, there's one thing you can do. You can communicate. You can help. You can pray. There's lots of things you can do. The question is, are you doing them? That's between you and the Lord. But he made a sacrifice for us. And that sacrifice was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ sacrificed a burnt sacrifice, you might say, for homage and thanksgiving that God's going to forgive you. No, that's not exact. You understand? I people say, "Well, where are you where are you going to get proof on the burnt uh, offering of hell?" I'm just telling you, he went to hell, and something happened there. Don't take my word for it. Read Acts two and Psalm 15, uh, sixteen. He went there, and in going there, when he came out of there, he saved us from it, and we don't have to fear hell or death, dying or anything else because we're with the Lord in Christ. And he is a guarantee sitting there that everything he had Paul write down is secure forever. Amen. 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 Amen.